this picture concerns emergency procedures in the B-17. What's your reaction? A guy's got a lot of responsibilities with a big plane like that. A lot of things to think about, even when everything's okay. Nothing had better go wrong. Fly until the wings fall off, I always say. Of course, that makes me a hot potter, but so what? You can't fly an airplane straight and level all the time. Emergencies? Well, what you do about them sort of depends, doesn't it? Sounds logical. Go on. Well, I mean, there's a lot of different things can go wrong. Depends on what the trouble is and what the circumstances are. Sometimes there's only one thing you can do. Sure, hit the sill. Back to the solid stuff. But that's only if the plane can't be flown and can't be landed. You can land her when you can't fly her sometimes, and without a landing field, too. Sure. Slide her in, place her belly gently on the ground, and slide for home. A little hard on the props. And the ball turret. Yeah, but plenty of guys have walked away from those, and a lot of times a plane's a long way from being a total loss. Uh, does that uh, answer your question? Well, in a way. But for movie purposes, can't you think of some emergencies with happy endings? Oh, sure. You don't always wind up on the ground. Keep them fine. Well, say, for instance, you're cruising along smooth as silk. Everything seems to be fine. You're putting a big, fat OK in your performance log. You're wondering if maybe the bombardier will give you one of his 23 sandwiches. When suddenly your co-pilot whips around and yells at you, Fire, number four engine. And in a few seconds, you've done about all you can do, except hope and maybe pray a little. Speed is the thing. Good point, Captain Scott. Can you slow it down enough to explain the reasons for some of the things you did? Well, sure, I guess so. Fire has to be fed by something, I figure. In an engine, that'd be gas and oil. They're the number one enemy, so I take care of them first. By shutting off the gas. Fuel shut off, valve closed, booster pump off. Then I feather it. So if an oil line's opened up, oil won't be squirting around in there, feeding the fire. During all this, I make plenty sure I'm shutting down the engine that's on fire and not some other engine. How about opening that throttle before you feather to get rid of the fuel ahead of the shutoff valve? Could be done, but it means waiting five or six seconds to start feathering. And if it's oil instead of gas that's burning, we just wasted time. Anyhow, unless you're in a descent, you're ordinarily drawing enough power for the carburetor to help meter out that gas during the feathering. You can usually tell whether it's a gas or an oil fire by the smoke. Sure, Anderson. Oil smoke is usually sort of gray, and smoke from gas is generally black. But personally, I won't be taking time to examine it, even if I can see it that clearly. I'd rather shut everything off that might be feeding that fire and ask questions afterwards. My co-pilot increases airspeed to try to blow the fire up, diving the plane, or if altitude is low, increasing power on the three good engines. Meanwhile, I get the cow flaps open on the engine that's on fire to help cool things off in there. Then, lock the cow flaps, so if the hydraulic line's broken, the fluid won't keep feeding the fire. The only other urgent business left, then, is to look for some level geography and hope that you don't have to use it or the alarm bell. Of course, somebody's got to keep the airplane flying. The guy on your right, or you. You got to keep up that wing that's lost the power and see that airspeed stays within the recommended limit. It's no good putting out an engine fire if you lose an airplane doing it. Chances are the fire will go off if you use what you know and work fast so it doesn't get too much head start on you. Then you can get your airplane trimmed when everything's under control and clean her up. Get the ignition off on the feathered engine, close those open cowl flaps to reduce drag when you're sure the engine fires out and things are cool enough, and fly her back to base on three.
Captain Scott, the next engine fire I have, I hope you're there. Thanks. Want my autograph? I guess not. All those X's look alike to me. Okay. What about these emergencies? You got any ideas about them? Why, sure. The floor is yours, Captain Sellers. Thanks. Well, let's see. Scott here goes in for obvious things like engine fires. I guess maybe I'll talk about an emergency situation you don't see right off. Subtle stuff. Well, maybe. Say so you've got a B-17 that's apparently okay. Her engines and controls are in perfect mechanical condition. Now, she should be as stable as a pool table, but she's not. She flies like a stove. Every time the pilot gets her nicely trimmed, she starts doing over the waves. She's unstable. He's fighting the control column all the time, correcting her attitude. Now, what's wrong? Her tail end's loaded down with some equipment or souvenirs or something like that, and her CG is too far aft. When he gets her home, he's got some sore muscles to remind him that a B-17 is safest and easiest to fly when you haven't messed up her original design. Now look how she's figured out. All the weight in her balances up, as though you've taken the pounds out of her structures, parts, fuel, and the tons out of her nacelles, lumped them all together and put them in a particular spot. That's practically what her designers did. They juggled her weights until center of gravity was near the forward end of the plane a good long distance from the stabilizer. That distance was a substitute for size in the stabilizers and elevators. Making them large would have given them power to control the attitude of the wing, but would also have increased drag and weight. So they were given the needed power another way, by keeping the area fairly small and by placing the airplane center of gravity well forward. And that gives them a lot of leverage to work with. With the airflow around her, center of gravity becomes a sort of pivot point. The airplane flies just as though she were suspended from a rod across her wings. Trim your airplane for level flight and she'll hold her own. When a gust hits that wing, causing it to rise, pushing her nose up, the stabilizer's angle of attack increases. They grab a little more airflow. And that small added force multiplied by all that leverage is enough to overpower the wing with all its added force. The airplane restores to trimmed attitude and trim speed. She's got longitudinal stability. Okay, but if Joe Dokes discovers a lot of room in her tail where he can put stuff and loads her up, uh-huh, she's like a different airplane. Look what's happened to her center of gravity. It's moved back. It wasn't riveted down, it's a point of balance. Move the weight and you move it. That pivot point moving back has shortened that lever arm. And the elevators and stabilizers have lost a lot of their leverage that they had before, a lot of their power. Now when a gust hits her wing, developing more forces up there, that tail is helpless. The wing takes off in a new direction and keeps on going. What's the cure? That's right, move the weight out of the tail. Get the center of gravity farther forward. Give the leverage back to the stabilizers and elevators. Now she's okay again. CG still isn't where it was originally, but it's close enough. There's some leeway. The mean aerodynamic cord measures 177 and a half inches. And if CG is anywhere from 32 to 19% of the cord length, back from the leading edge of the wing, elevators and stabilizers have the leverage that they need. Now, that gives you about two feet of range. Use the load adjuster that comes with your airplane. Calculate your CG, stay within that range, and you'll have a stable airplane to fly. One that's less tiring on long missions, more accurate for bombing, and safer on instruments. Nice lecture, Doctor. Thanks. Yeah, just one loophole. That business about the airplane being loaded so far aft, it's clear out of control. It's pretty extreme. Well, it isn't impossible, is it? No, but you can fly them when CG is after 32 quite a bit, even after 35 with a downspring. It's hard work, yeah, but it still isn't what you'd call an emergency. It could be. Well? Well, look, say you've got an airplane that's unstable because of rearward CG. You're in the overcast and you're on instruments. busy with something else besides the controls, and so is your co-pilot. 
Maybe you don't realize how unstable your plane is. You could wind up in one of those spots that pilots have bad dreams about. chances stalling the B-17. Stalls are too dangerous in such a big plane. Control forces might overpower the pilot. But that nightmare belongs to pilots who've never stalled the airplane. Not that they should rush right out and try it. That's prohibited. A stall is no picnic. But it's not ordinarily a serious emergency either. Unless the pilot reacts too slowly or does the wrong thing. I was thinking of a pilot who stalls his plane inadvertently. He knows what goes on, sure, he'll be okay. If not, it might be bad, that's all. Uh, Captain Sellers, this is a training film. What about stalls? Well, in general, well, the stalling characteristics of a Ford are quite a source of comfort. Our on stalls are more violent. Our on accelerated stalls are dynamite, just as in any plane. And most stalls aren't that kind. That's my boy there who's talking. Go on, you're doing fine. What happens? Well, let's see. The B-17 goes into a stall. The stall begins at the root of the wing, spreading out toward the tip, so that the wing tips cease flying last. That's good. Completely stalled head on, she drops without much tendency to fall off on one wing. Ease her nose down and you're flying again. The danger of spinning out is slight because of that dorsal fin. It's one of the biggest vertical stabilizers in the business and it gives the airplane directional stability. So her tendency, instead of spinning out of a stall, is to hold the direction in which she originally stalled. That's good, too. When you stall on a turn, of course, you've got a low wing to think about. Use the rudder to lift it. Never use aileron to recover from a stall. It'll only make things worse. And your control reaction should be immediate, but moderate, never violent. You don't need to dive her. Ease her down as soon as you get the stall warning. Warning usually comes about five miles an hour ahead of the stalling speed of the airplane. The tail buffets and you know something's about to happen. And you usually have plenty of time to recover during that warning period. Don't slam her nose down. Just bring it down easily to the horizon. And you've got full control again. She won't even settle much. Go into action when you get that stall warning. Chances are you won't ever get into a really violent stall. In any case, if your plane's loaded right, you'll have both longitudinal and directional stability to help you keep out of trouble. Those two and a combination of a good working knowledge of your plane is all you need. Sellers, where'd you get all that book learning? Book learning? One kind of a stall you overlooked. A lot of guys were afraid of it. What's that? Stall when you retract wing flaps. Like on a go-around, where you're pretty close to the ground and can't afford to lose altitude. Well, what about it? Sure, Anderson, you give out for a change. How much to it? You won't stall when you spill your flaps if you're above flaps up stalling speed of your plane. Reassuring, Captain. Uh, care to go into the reasons why? Well, it's really pretty simple. I'm not much on studying books, I mean, like sellers. Say, listen. So I asked a guy about it one time when I had the chance. He's one of those aerodynamicists who works in the wind tunnel. Pretty smart Joe. The way he explained it, here's the wing of your airplane. Its angle is always the same in relation to the airplane. The angle at which it attacks the airflow is subject to change. Change the angle of attack, you vary the amount of lift developed by the wing. Steeper angle, greater lift. Of course, you do that by changing the attitude of your airplane. 
But there's another way you can get about the same effect. Lower your wing flaps. It's just as though you'd increase the wing's angle of attack by nosing the airplane up. All right, your flying flaps down, your airplane speed and attitude are adjusted to that condition. Then you retract those flaps. What happens? You lose some of the lift, trim of the plane changes. There's less downwash on the tail, it rises. The airplane noses down a little and picks up speed. Quite a bit of speed, in fact, because you've also lost flap drag. Now that's all satisfactory, except that loss in altitude. If you don't want that, you'll have to do something else. Flaps down again. Now this time, as they come up, pull the nose of your airplane up. So the wing's actual angle of attack will be the same when flaps are up as, as it was for all practical purposes when flaps are down. Now have you lost anything? Not altitude, certainly. By pulling the nose up, you've kept the lifting power of the wing constant. And you've gained some speed because you've lost the drag of those flaps. Just watch your airspeed. As long as the airspeed is above stalling speed of the plane with the flaps up, you can spill them, pull her nose up to hold altitude without fear of stalling her. OK? Useful information. How do you apply it? Like I said, when you have to make a go around or almost any time you want to spill flaps and keep altitude. Like in the short distance takeoff I did one time with a student. An emergency takeoff? Let's hear about it. You're stuck for an explanation now, Andy. Ooh, ordinarily, there's nothing to it, really. How do you do it? <laughs> OK. You use one third wing flaps, 15 degrees, to increase lift of the wing. That takes weight off the wheels, cuts down wheel drag faster, so you get up more speed and get off sooner. Also, you run your engines up to full military power before releasing the brakes. Get more speed from the start. It's a good trick if you've got a runway that have to slow you down a bit. Slush, mud, turf. Or if you've got a runway that's a little shorter than it should be. This one time, the runway was a little short, with an obstacle at the end of it, and not the kind you'd pick if you had a choice. The student with me didn't like it any better than I did. But he doesn't scare easy. He sizes up the situation and goes to work. When everything's set, he orders one-third flaps. And we get the flaps set. Then he pours the coal to her, building up to full military power. Breaks off, and we're on our way. I don't have to coach you much. Keep that tail down. Need all the lift we can get from that wing. Not too much, or you will add wheel drag. That's it. Gear comes up as soon as possible. Checks engine operation and number four looks bad. We're losing it. Let the kid know about it. Get set to take it away from him. Losing number four engine. Get that wing up now. Right engine dead. Left rudder, left aileron. Flying the airplanes always first. Good. Keep right wing a little high. More speed will give us more control, though. Spend a little altitude, buy some speed. We can climb if we have to. Ought to get his flaps up before he feathers, if he has any power at all in the bad engine, especially if the airplane's heavy. Air speed's okay for it. Flaps up, the kid gives the command. Those are up a little, son. Still work to do. She's losing oil pressure. And the kid comes right back. Feather number four. Feathering button first. Turbo and throttle. Then mixture and the cowl flaps.
spot a joker once who feathered the wrong one. Better not feather at all than hit the wrong button. Got speed now. We can start climbing. Reduce power. 38 inches. RPM 2300. Always should have at least 100 feet of altitude. And airspeed of 135 before reducing power and starting the climb. Trim her up and we'll take her to home base. Long as we're out of the woods, we can clean her all up. Would have cut fuel first if it had looked like a fire hazard. Fly the airplane. That comes first, last, and always. The rest of it's pretty much normal procedure, bringing her back. We don't use flaps until we're darn sure of being able to come on in. One third on the base leg, full flaps on final approach. She'll float a little coming in with one feather. Allow for it. Tabs are neutral now. The kid's keeping that right wing up. Keep it well up until you're on the final approach and reducing power. I guess the kid will do. If you think we actually spent that much time doing it, you're nuts. <sighs> Anderson, how'd you ever set that plane down on that short runway? I didn't. Brought it home where there's plenty of landing room. But you took off from that short runway. You must have had to land on it sometime. Well, oh no. You don't get me to talk about a short distance landing too. Oh, come on. Not me, brother. I'm all talked out. Uh, Captain Scott, it was your idea. Okay, but Anderson should have done it for you. Just the reverse of the short distance takeoff. On the approach, you bring her in slow. And set her down as near the end of the runway as possible. If you don't have much to begin with, you don't want to waste any. Lander three point. Now start your flaps coming up and get your tail up as soon as you touch. That reduces lift gets a lot of weight down on the main landing gear where the brakes are. Ordinarily, that much brake pressure, it means skidding. But with so much extra weight on the wheels, it all goes into drag. The drag's what you want to keep your landing distance down. You can ground loop her, too, if you have to. About those brakes now, they're dual jobs with two expander tubes instead of one. And there's not the danger of brake failure there used to be. But these double brakes really take a hold. Don't ride them any harder than you really have to. On this short distance landing especially. When you really climb on and bear down, you can lose a tire. And having one of your wheels disintegrate isn't going to help you stay on the runway. Play it on the safe side when you're breaking those wheels for a short distance landing or in any emergency. Use what you know. Figure your percentages and bet where the odds are smallest against you. This stuff isn't cut and dried. Some guy figures something out, he tries it, and if it seems to work, passes it on to the next guy. He's done some figuring for himself and probably knows a better way. Sure. Anderson here doesn't speak many English, but what he means is, keep your mind open. Work at it all the time. Nobody has the last word in stuff like this. That's right. Not even in a movie.